we simply cannot allow people to pour into the United States undetected, undocumented, unchecked. And complete the dang fence. This bill that we will sign today is not a revolutionary bill. Cast down your bucket where you are. We come from France. And I am, you know, adamantly against illegal immigrants. They're coming in by the thousands, just unbelievable. A Deal. wall is an immorality. Who are you rooting for? Those masters of the universe are at it again. You maniac! You blew it up! Welcome to Parsing Immigration Policy, the podcast of the Center for Immigration Studies. My name is Mark Krikori, an executive director of the Center. And today we're going to talk about something that seems sort of inside baseball-ish in Washington, but is really very important. And that is the Freedom of Information Act, the way it's usually referred to as FOIA, F-O-I-A, because of the initials. And we have on the show a relatively new member of our team, Colin Farnsworth, who is our FOIA whisperer. That's not his title, actually, but he's the director of our FOIA operations. And I mean, he'll go into more detail about this, but the point of the act, the Freedom of Information Act, is to enable people outside the government to demand that the government reveal information that isn't public yet, but should be. So this isn't, this obviously, you know, the the identity of our spies in Lebanon or something that's not covered by this, but there's a lot of regular information The government either just doesn't bother releasing to the public or, frankly, for some reason, may want to hide. And the point of this legislation is to create this process whereby people on the outside, the regular public, research groups, whoever it is, can demand certain information. And uh, so, Colin, thanks for joining us on the show. And if you could start just giving a little background about how you got into doing this FOIA stuff. I mean, it's not like this is a career path that your guidance counselor in high school would have told you about. How how did you end up uh, stumbling into this? I actually had a mentor who through law school was kind of schooling me on FOIA and ended up working for a small public interest law firm for a while. And, And as a kid, you know, growing up, I had heard about FOIA and was, in, you know, always a fan of transparency and seeking out corruption and exposing government corruption. And so that just always interests me. But the mentor really kind of got me into FOIA and really found a passion for it and worked for his small public interest law firm for a while and then ended up moving on to kind of a large national law firm whose main client was for FOIA, that is a large media organization. And so we just were busting out just hundreds of FOIA requests. And that's where I kind of really cut my teeth about the entire administrative process and building a FOIA program to scale. Yeah, that's kind of where it all began. It found me more than I found it, but I really love it and and love what it does for for our society and and really puts a kind of uh, shines a light on government and government actions. Yeah, most of my experience is you sort of dumb into most things, you know what I mean? In other words, uh, maybe there's some (laughs) people who have their life planned out, but for most of us, it doesn't work that way. So just if you could give us the sort of TLDR version of what is FOIA and how do you make a FOIA request, that sort of thing, sort of the basics kind of walk people through it. Sure, sure. Well, yeah, like you said, the the Freedom of Information Act is a federal law, and it requires federal agencies to provide records to any person that makes a written request for one. It was enacted in 1966, and there's been numerous amendments since then that have improved transparency in the rights of requesters. And people should know that there are, similar to the federal FOIA, every state has enacted its own public records laws that enable people to obtain government records at the state level. And so federal FOIA doesn't really cover state records or state agencies. It's only for federal purposes. But if people are interested in school board meetings or other things, they can t- they can target their own state records. And a great website for that is www.muckrock.com. That's M-U-C-K-R-O-C-K. And there they do a breakdown of the different laws of every jurisdiction in the in the country of their different public records of law. So it's a great place to start. But interesting. Yeah, going back to the federal FOIA, courts have summarized the purpose and importance by saying the basic purpose of FOIA is to ensure an informed citizenry 
vital to the functioning of a democratic society, needed to check against the corruption and to hold the government accountable to the governed. And so basically it's a tool for everyone, activists, bloggers, independent journalists, corporate media organizations, and it allows people to obtain records. It doesn't force the government to create records. So that's a big problem that a lot of requesters have. They, they want the, the government to compile a record that shows such and such. Well, the FOIA is not meant to do that. It can get you emails. It can get you reports, memos, audio and video recordings and PowerPoint slides, you name it. But those records have to already exist. They won't be created for you. The one caveat to that is that they are obligated to extract and compile records from a larger digital database. There's, there was a recent amendment that now makes that an obligation for, for agencies to comply with. And so they, they might create a spreadsheet of a particular data set pulled from a larger data set. And, and, and that is, in a sense, creating a record, but not really. Those records already exist. They're just kind of reformulating the maybe Excel spreadsheet or other database to pull out that, that data. Yeah, could I? I mean, that's, that's interesting. So it's, it does have to be, in other words, if you're going to ask for something extra, it does have to be digital in some sense. And let me just, the reason I'm asking this, let me just give you the background for this. One of the things we tried to get once was the number of DACA applicants who used translators to file their applications. And there's actually a box on the paper application that says, you know, this was an interpreter and you were the interpreter's name and everything. And what I was told was, and I just, this was just me talking to somebody high up in USCIS, was that that data exists in 800,000 pieces of paper, but was never compiled. In other words, they themselves don't know what share of people use those because they never recorded the data digitally. Is that the kind of thing that would not be covered by FOIA? Yeah, that's, that's exactly, that's a great example, actually. That, that would require them to go into each of these different PDFs or whatever files they have. They, they didn't compile it themselves. Right. And so now you're asking them to go through and give us a percentage of these people. And they're not required by law to do that. If they have already done that, if their system, their data system already has that and they have some way to manipulate that data to then extract it, then they are forced to. That's actually a fantastic example of kind of the, the nuance of how that works and, and, and may not work. So, you know, what's the, how do you do that? Well, if somebody were to wanted to file a FOIA request, what do they do? How do they ask for it? Who do they send it to, et cetera? Sure. Yeah. So. Generally speaking, there are kind of six phases to the FOIA administrator process. The first phase is the agency's receipt of the request. And depending on the agency you're targeting, you should go to their website and ask, you know, how, how to submit a request to CBP or whatever the agency you're wanting. And they're going to give you probably three different options. You can either email it to you or email it to the agency. You can snail mail it to the agency or you can use a special Internet FOIA portal which requires you to sign up and kind of create a username and password. And oftentimes you have to provide an, an email address and your maybe a physical address, which sometimes people find intrusive. So maybe you prefer to do snail mail, but I prefer either an email or using the internet portals to get records. And each there again, you have to check with the agency of which method that they require. Mm -hmm. And the important part of this, this step is the date that the agency receives the receipt of the request. And the reason that is, is because the agency under law has 20 or 30 business days to comply with your request and comply with your request means that they are giving you a determination saying, yes, we received your request and we are going to fulfill that request. There is a misunderstanding that people think that they are entitled to get the actual records within 20 or 30 days. And that's not the case. If you can imagine, you know, some of these things are it takes 10,000 pages to fulfill your request. Sure. That's not going to be impossible to create in 20, 30 days. But they do have to say, hey, we have your request and we, we plan to fulfill it. That is their legal obligation, the 20, 30 days. And believe it or not, they have a hard time even, for, you know, complying with those 20 and 30 days. So it's really important to keep your receipt because there are certain privileges you get if they violate that. The first privilege is that you can sue. You can sue the agency immediately after those on the 21st day, you set your reminder. They didn't even reply at all. It gave you no response. You can sue. Mm -hmm. And in fact, a great story just recently, uh, CIS uh, just filed a lawsuit against CBP for violating FOIA time limits. They never provided us any response to one of our requests. This request was seeking the nationalities of 
and other information regarding people that CBP caught crossing the border illegally and who were also identified to be on the terrorist watch list. And so we were thought it was uh, probably pretty important for the public to know these days with the heightened uh, security threats we're facing. Right. That w- what nationalities are these people coming across? Well, CBP didn't respond at all. And so, you know, CIS wanted to waste no time in enforcing the agency to comply with these obligations. And so we sued. And so you can do that within that 20 or 30 day time period. But you also have to prove with to the court that, you know, you have proof of when that request was submitted and received by the agency, because that's when that time clock starts. It is true that when you do sue, you actually do end up getting records faster much of the time, especially for complex FOIA requests. But, you know, it's, it, it is expensive process to do. And, and, and you should before you sue and before you, you know, before you do that, I did and I recommend others, you know, reach out to the agency. Hey, what's the deal with my request? Right. A great after the 20 or 30 days, it's a great procedure to reach out to them and ask them for an estimated completion date. Under FOIA, they're required to provide you with an estimated completion date if upon request. And so after those 20 or 30 days are up. It's a great policy just for yourself to check in with the agency, ask them, hey, can you provide that? And there again, if they ghost you again, that's a good sign that they're kind of just planning to to process your FOIA request or there might be something wrong. Interesting. So I had just a couple of questions. First of all, I don't get into too much detail, but why is it 20 or 30 days? Is it different depending on the kind of the request or the receiver <laughs> yeah, or what? So. 20 days is is the requirement under FOIA, but they do provide for an exception for unusual circumstances. Right. So in unusual circumstances, they allow you to do 30 days. And, and most of the time, and it, I don't know, you know, it's no longer unusual circumstances. It's usually just unusual circumstances because in almost every acknowledgement letter you get back says, hey, there's unusual circumstances. Yeah, right. We need 30 days. <laughs> right. So it's kind of the more st- it's the more standard one now. But that is the reason I forgot to mention that the other privilege you get besides being able to sue is that once that time limit is violated, you have the ability to waive either all or some of the processing fees. So as one of the incentives for agencies to process your request on time is that they will be able to accrue fees for processing it. If they don't, then the requester gets to bypass those fees in in some cases. So that's another reason to make sure that you keep your records about when that was actually received so you can potentially later on get your waiver of fees. My other question, it was, and maybe you're going to get into this, but the crafting the request itself is pretty important because if you ask for, I mean, in other words, you can't just say, hey, why don't you give me some info about X, Y, and Z? You need to be able to say, I need this record about this from this date. In other words, you need to, the more specific you are, the more likely you are to actually get what you want. Isn't that correct? Totally. And there is a different phase. I'll talk about that more, but people are very eager often to, to get a request out really quickly and let's get this request out. But it actually slows the process down if you don't submit a well-crafted request. It pays dividends to do a, a lot of research in the beginning to craft the phrasing that you're asking for really well to target not just a broad agency like DHS in general, but fine tune that request to go s- to submit it to maybe one of their sub agencies. And then even within their sub agencies, try to target a few offices or subdivisions of that agency to target with your request. And that will increase your chances of, of having a successful processing of your request. And a lot of people try to fast track that, but I'll talk that more in kind of the phase three, which is perfecting the request, which we'll get more into the legal restrictions. Sure. Go ahead. After the first phase, uh, the second phase is the agency's acknowledgement of the request. And this is usually in the form of a formal acknowledgement letter. And this letter will oftentimes provide you with a a specific tracking number. And once you get this tracking number, every communication that you have with the request, including that estimated completion date that I mentioned earlier, should include this tracking number. If it doesn't, then it effectively says that communication doesn't exist. Interesting. So it's really important every communication has that tracking number. This letter might also determine whether or not they are accepting and willing to process your FOIA request, kind of their obligations under that 20 or 30 day rule. It may also determine in that letter, which it often does, whether there are unusual circumstances requiring that 30 day limit opposed to the 20 day limit. And it also in that letter will probably determine if you requested a fee waiver or expedited processing, it will determine whether you were approved or denied. And at that point, anytime you get any denial you need to appeal within 90 days. And that is actual days. Unlike the 20 or 30 day time limit that I've been mentioning all along here, that's actually 20 business days or 30 business days. 
your days to appeal are 90 days, and that is strict day count, not business days. Right. Okay. And so then to phase three, and this is this is where, yeah, you, you were mentioning, this is probably the most important phase and it doesn't have to be if you did a bunch of work before you submitted your request, you might be fine. But this is where a lot of requests go to die. Unfortunately, hmm. it's kind of where agencies kind of shit test the requester to determine if they really have what it takes to get the records. So a request must be, quote unquote, reasonably described. And what this means under under law is a FOIA request must describe the records it seeks with enough detail to enable an agency employee familiar with the subject matter to locate the records with a reasonable amount of effort. And as you can imagine, the standard is kind of highly subjective. And because of this, it's used kind of to weed out a lot of non-serious requesters. People people get the response back saying, oh, this request is too broad or you have not reasonably described as closed. And a lot of people give up there. That's just, you know, that's just the end of the line. They don't they, they don't understand the process. And so is this done? And the agency can kind of weed out a lot of these requests. And to be fair to the agency, you know, a lot of amateur requesters are submitting pretty poorly written requests. They get a lot of them per day and there has to be some process to kind of weed out some of these. But I've submitted, you know, of course, of course, I've submitted perfect requests and they get lumped into this category of not reasonably described. And then there again, that's an adverse determination. Once you get that decision, you have 90 days to appeal it. And you and you should if you uh, believe it was reasonably described. So basically that that step is a way for the bureaucracy if they don't want to give you the information to you know, create problems for you and hope you go right. away, basically. Totally. Each one of these phases is another phase where they can have that opportunity to, you know, if they don't like your request or they think that request is going to shed some bad light on them, they might, they might do that. You know, that's kind of a dark way to look at the agencies, but <laughs> it, I've, it definitely appears to be that way in some of these cases when, you know, they perfectly responded to this request and this request is fine, but this other request, which you submitted way before that other request, they're not even touching it. Interesting. So when a request is determined to be not reasonably described, there's several things that can happen depending on the agency. Under FOIA, FOIA allows agencies to write their own regulations under FOIA. So they have to abide by FOIA, but they can write their own regulations, kind of fine tuning how they abide by FOIA. Mm -hmm. And so this is where it kind of varies. So one response you might get is that the request will be immediately closed. They'll get a letter to you saying, your request is not reasonably described. It doesn't follow the guidelines of FOIA. We have administrative close your request. And then they should give you your rights of appeal. And then you can appeal that. FBI is known to do this. ICE is known to do this. A lot of agencies, they have no obligations to work with you to fine tune your request. They'll just close it down immediately. A story about this, just actually just the other day, CIS, we had to appeal FBI's determination that one of our requests was not reasonably described. And there again, it was just, just a letter like that. Not reasonably described is closed. And this request was identical to the one we sent to CBP regarding the nationalities of those apprehended at the border who were on the terrorist watch list. Mm -hmm. And there again, it's, it, you know, it's one of those like, yeah, they they probably don't want to produce that information for one reason or another. And so this is kind of a tactic showing that, uh, you know, like you try again or giving us kind of that shit test of whether or not we're serious about getting these records. And we are. We're, we appealed. And depending on their denial or acceptance, we, we might have to go to court on that one as well. The other response that you might get, there are other agencies that are more friendly in terms of their federal regulations requiring them to work with the requester to kind of work out the kinks to make it reasonably described. So HHS and, and FDA, they're known to kind of have more back and forth with the requester. Interesting. They might send you a, a modification request or a modification request would be, we want you to actually narrow the scope. You're actually going to change the scope a little bit. Instead of like, you know, the quest is for a four year span, you might narrow it to a two year span. Mm -hmm. So that's a modification. And they might send you that or they might send you a clarification notice saying, all right, we don't fully understand what records you're asking for. Can you please provide us a little bit more details about this or that? And so they're trying to work with you. But there are a few ways that they use this that there again, that maybe to delay things or to maybe create some some other problems when you get these letters. That 20 or 30 day timeline we talked about earlier, that is now paused. So uh, if you're on your 15th day of your timeline and you're eager to sue on this and they send you a clarification letter and you forget about it for a year or six months or whatever, <laughs> your request is dead in the water until you respond and the agency has no obligation to continuing to contact you. Interesting. So it will just sit there 
and your opportunity to get those records is now dead until you respond. The other one that they might do is they'll send you one of these clarification or modification letters, but they'll put a 10 or 20 or 30 day time limit for you to respond. And if you don't respond, they'll say they'll administratively close a request. And so if you can imagine, you know, they get 100 requests in one day and they send out to each of those requesters, say you have 10 days to respond to this inquiry for clarification. You can imagine 20% of those are not going to be able to respond in 20 days or those 10 days. And they just cut out, you know, 20% of those ones that they have to process. So it's kind of a tool for them to put then a a shot clock back on the requester. And they're going to just kind of testing them to see if they're serious or organized enough to respond to the request. Interesting. Interesting. So what's the next phase? Well, it, there is more phases, but there's this one, because it's so important, I, there's a few, okay, sure. there's a couple yeah. other things to talk about Go ahead. about this phase, because what we talked about now is just simply just, you know, whether or not it's reasonably described, but even when you reasonably describe the records, it doesn't necessarily fulfill this reasonably described standard because then the agency has to determine whether they can process that information with a reasonable amount of time and they'll determine your request. If it takes them too long to locate or process these records, they'll say it's overly burdensome or overly broad request. And if you get this determination, everyone should know that the agency bears a burden to provide a sufficient explanation as to why they determined your request overly broad or overly burdensome. So you can put the onus on them. Some, most of the times they'll give you a letter saying, oh, it's just overly broad. You should email them and say, you need to explain why. And if they don't, you should probably put in your appeal that they failed to bear their burden to provide a sufficient explanation as why that was overly burdensome or overly broad. And in my experience, I generally look for two things when an agency has determined my one of my requests to be overly burdensome or overly broad. And, and that is, I want them to have shown in some way that they actually conducted a preliminary search, maybe not a full search, but at least a preliminary search to show that they know what they're talking about. They're not, they didn't just take one glance at this thing and, and just determine that it is overly broad, that they might have, you know, they dug into some records that actually conducted a preliminary search. The other thing that I'm looking for is some type of quantifier to back up their decision, either numbers or facts. For example, if they say, you know, our preliminary search showed that we found 10,000 responsive pages of records, you know, that's, that's a lot of records to process. And that, that is, it's not impossible. It doesn't for sure mean it's overly broad. I, I've seen cases where the government was forced to produce millions of documents, and that was for FDA's approval of the Pfizer COVID vaccine vaccine. Someone FOIA'd for that information, and, and the government had to give up millions. So the number doesn't necessarily mean, but generally if, for most requests, if it's over 10,000 pages, that is probably overly broad. Another one that you might get is, like, hey, you know, your request is going to require us to search 70 agency personnel's emails for for your specific terms. You know, that's a that's a lot of people to search. You might want to think about narrowing it. And even for the 10,000 page, like does the average requester want to sift through 10,000 pages sure. of documents to find the needle in the haystack? So I think it's, it's in everyone's benefit to kind of narrow it as much as possible. Don't don't play games here if you don't if, unless you have to. The other thing about getting 10,000 pages of records is that even in litigations, courts will limit the agency's requirement to produce records to about 500 pages a month. So hmm. I'm not the best at math, but that would take a long time to get those 10,000 pages. And so if you, if you're eager to get these pages quickly or your documents quickly it's best to narrow it as much as you can do. And that goes back to really in the beginning, thinking about your request and doing research, a great research step to do is, you know, look up the organizational charts for the agency you're targeting. And, and if you go online and type that in, Every organization has these organizational charts and you can look at all the subdivisions and sometimes even the personnel in those subdivisions. And some of them have their titles, uh, their their employment titles. And that's a great way to kind of fine tune your request to narrow it as much as possible. And you can send multiple requests so you can you can target different folks for different concepts and kind of break up your request into a few different ones. And that sometimes makes it easier to process. Interesting. And and basically more likely that they'll comply with it. and less likely that they'll cause you problems, basically. Exactly, exactly. I mean, yeah, the, the problems aren't fun for anybody. So if you can do your part to narrow it as much as possible, that's a, that's a great way to do it. Okay. So that's the third phase, the, and that's a big one. Like I said, a big one where a lot of them go to die. The fourth phase 
is pretty simple. This is the agency's search for responsive records. So after it's perfected, that's when they conduct their real search. You know, they might do a preliminary search in that third phase, but in this fourth phase, they're, they got, they know it, the, the, the request is perfected, and now they're searching for records. The, the only thing I guess I'll mention in this one is about fees, processing fees and reviewing fees. It may have been determined in the last phase or this phase that there are certain costs established with researching, reviewing, and producing these records. And and this can sometimes be used to effectively deny requests. So I've seen I've seen agency estimates for processing records up to thirty thousand dollars. And you know, for the average requester, that's not possible. So as soon as you get that request for those fees, you know, you're just kind of dead in the water. You're not gonna be able to pay that, and so they're not gonna fulfill your request. One way around this is media organizations and academic and scientific institutions, they can ask for fee waiver requests that to waive all these fees or a good portion of these fees. And so Center for Immigration Studies does this. And one thing that the common requester can do, maybe the blogger, is that they, if they have a great FOIA request uh, that they're eager about getting and they think it's going to get some good information, they can seek out some organization that either nonprofit or for-profit or academic or scientific and seek out someone in that institution and say, hey, can we submit this request on your behalf? And that way we can then put in a fee waiver request and you can get around these fees. And so uh, we'll talk about this later, but you know, Center for Immigration Studies is a- actively looking for whistleblowers and border informants that may have information. And we can use FOIA with them to collaborate their, their findings and we can oftentimes get these fees waived because of our status as a representative of the news media. And there again, if you request that and it gets denied, you have to appeal 90 days after that decision. And if you don't, you know, they by the end when they produce these records and say, hey, or they won't produce them yet, but they'll say, hey, you have to produce the, you have to pay these fees and you're not comfortable with those fees. Well, you already passed your opportunity to appeal the fee waiver. So every time you get those adverse decisions, definitely appeal. Right. The fifth phase is the agencies then processes the records. So they find all the records. Now they are processing them. What that means is that they are reviewing the records to redact ones that fall under one of the nine FOIA exemptions. And so if you can imagine, if you're going through 10,000 emails, that review person has to review every line, every email to determine if it's personal information, whether it's a threat to national security, whether it's a deliberative process. And so it takes a long time to go through these records, and that's where a, a bulk of the time is spent Interesting. on processing these requests, is reviewing the materials and, and redacting this information. I'm not going to go into all the different exemptions because there's nine of them, and it could it could take up a whole podcast in itself. But I will direct people to a great resource if they went to any search engine and typed in Department of Justice Guide to the Freedom of Information Act. They break down each one of these exemptions and they and they actually provide case law and the contours and scope of each of these FOIA exemptions and it should provide even the novice with kind of expert level knowledge of of how to fight or determine whether these exemptions used in their productions were accurate or not right so the sixth phase the final the final phase and remember this is just the administrative process after the administrative process and after you appeal or if you choose to appeal then you can go to court, which is a whole nother process. But this is this is the six phases of the administrative process. So the six phase is kind of the agency has reviewed the documents and now they're going to release them. And now the requester reviews the responsive records. And in your initial request, I always specifically ask the agency to produce my records in digital format. This mm-hmm. usually saves time because they don't have to print out all these records. And it also saves money. Some people get a disk. I rather them just email me a a large PDF or zip file to my email. I think it's faster. So I would do that in your request. The requester should then review the materials to determine if there are any reasons to appeal. You have 90 days of the date of receipt of those productions to do so. A few reasons that you might appeal are the adequacy of the search. And this means that you have reasons to believe that there are Responsive records that are missing or have been unreasonably overlooked during the search. Mm -hmm. So if you requested emails from, say, 2021 to 2023 and you're reviewing all the emails and you don't see any from 2021, well, that's a good sign that they probably misread or mistook your request and failed to search for or include any of those records from 2021. And you could put that summary into your appeal and and appeal that that determination that they produce all the records that they had to. Another 
reason to appeal would be that you looked over their redactions and you believe that there are improper redactions that don't fit the exemption claimed. So an example of this is one of our recent lawsuits against CBP. We wanted to know the different airports that illegal immigrants were flying into using the CBP one app to obtain humanitarian parole and potentially uh, future asylum claims. This information we believe to be helpful to the public to inform different states and community like who might be most burdened by the sudden influx of these illegal immigrants into their communities. And so if you can imagine, you know, right now, New York City and Chicago are are being inundated with a lot of illegal immigrants. And if we could find that how many people are flying actually into the airports, not only just bust in, but how many are being flown into the airports, we could kind of show how severe the strain is on those communities. In fact, uh, there was a recent report, Todd Benzman reported that a few of these airports from this data that we got received over 30,000 illegal immigrants during this year alone. And so when we got that data, all the airports, they they showed us there were 42 different airports and they showed us how many number were coming in each of those airports, but they redacted the different names of those airports. So we couldn't Hmm. tell whether it was Chicago or whether it was New York City. And they redacted them under uh, Exemption 7E and their argument was that this this protects law enforcement techniques and procedures. And we're looking at these. We don't want we don't we still to this day don't under, fully understand how these are techniques and procedures by redacting just the airports. These are public areas right. that these people are flying into how that really falls under 7E. So we're going to challenge that. And, and that that doesn't seem to fit. And maybe they'll maybe they'll fully justify it. But we're going to challenge it. And that'd be something that the common requesters should do is it doesn't make sense. Look at that guide that I told you to seek out on the uh, DOJ's website and see if it really fits and then target that. The other big one that people can challenge is whether or not the agency reasonably segregated non-exempt records from exempt records. And what this means is that they have an obligation to, if there's a long string of emails and one of those emails has information that might be of national security, they can redact that little piece of information, but they can't redact the entire email. Interesting. They right. have to they have to produce all records that are not exempt, and they can only redact ones that are exempt. And so, if you ever see like large blocks of redacted items uh, in your the productions, uh, chances are you could go back to them and say, "Hey, these are not reasonably segregated. You need to reasonably segregate the non exempt portions of the exempt records." And we want to see what they're what they're talking about. And oftentimes I'll have to do that. One caveat to that is for drafts, drafts. That's where I oftentimes see the most just block redactions that I can't really challenge. Drafts are under exemption five, kind of deliberative process privilege. And drafts you oftentimes can't get and they'll fully redact them because of various reasons. Sure. But interesting. But for emails, you should see most of the email. You should see kind of who's being sent to. The subject matter, different attachments, they can't just block out everything. And sometimes they attempt that. Right. So there again, you need to appeal any of these decisions within 90 days of that, of, of getting those records. So basically, I mean, what you're described is sounds really kind of like a cat and mouse game. You know what I mean? In other words, they're trying to avoid being pinned down and you're with increasing specificity trying to pin them down. I mean, again, maybe I'm, uh, I have a sort of jaundiced view, <laughs> but it seems to me that, you know, generally speaking, if they wanted to release data, they'd be releasing it. And if they aren't, you know, it's because they would rather not. And so trying to, you know, come up with roadblocks and obstructions that will make you go away at some point, it seems to me is something that the bureaucracy is definitely going to want to do. Yeah, I, I think the cat and mouse game, that's definitely the way I sense it going down. And it is amazing how some requests just so flawlessly go through and clearly there wasn't a care in the world for it. And then other requests that are very similar, but maybe in a different political matter, somehow get caught at every level. Right. And so it it is a big cat and mouse game and people should just people should just enjoy the ride and, and definitely push <laughs> back and, have you know, uh, right. Have fun at it. But it does require a, a lot of back and forth, and it's not just a simple thing to do. But I will say that the federal government is pretty good at providing the public 
with enough resources to be able to navigate this process on their own, at least the administrative phase. You know, it gets a little definitely trickier at the judicial review phase, but, you know, there's enough resources out there that people can do their own appeals if you read that resource guide and take the time to do it. And uh, I suggest people, you know, challenge, challenge it. You get those get those records of public interest and um, take this opportunity and your right to get these records. And, you know, this is something you mentioned at the beginning. If all of that is not something that you're qualified or prepared or inclined to do, but that you do have an idea or you do have information about a specific document, say, that is in is somewhere in the government's, uh, you know, in that big warehouse from Indiana Jones, you know, where the uh, Ark of the Covenant is, if you get the movie reference, but you're not prepared to do all of this, we actually can potentially take this on ourselves. And we have a button on our website, a big red lurid button that you can click on to take you to a page where we have a secure email address. If you have information for us, for us to pursue this kind of thing, rather than the individual having to do it. If you could just tell us a little bit about that whistleblower thing. We are seeking out people, uh, either border informants or whistleblowers that have information on the failures of U.S. immigration policies, the willful neglect of agency responsibilities, the fraud, waste, and abuse of government resources, the scope of the human trafficking crisis, the economic burden on states and municipalities, abuses of immigration policies and programs, uh, or other harms uh, by a legal or legal immigration crisis. You know, if you have insider knowledge or knowledge about it, it yes. Go to that big red button at the cis.org website in the top right corner and click that and follow the directions there and give us a little synopsis of the information you have. And we can help corroborate that information by using FOIA. You know, if you have that information, we can then get those records to kind of prove it. We can also keep your identity anonymous if you so choose to. And we also at the CIS have a capacity to we are a media organization that can get this out there to the eyes uh, of many people. And we also have many connections in D.C. and with policymakers to actually create some effective change. And so if people have this information, you know, we're not we're not interested in the illegal immigrant next door who plays his music very loud right, or not exactly. or Moses Lawn early. We're not interested in that. But if you have like kind of that list of things I just just mentioned information on that, those topics, uh, we do want to hear about it. And that can those are the types of things that can uh, really effectuate change. So we have created this opportunity that people can outreach to us and, and we're happy to work with them to get information that will generally make our immigration system better. And just to wrap up, just to sort of tie a bow on that, this also would apply, as we suggested, calling it a whistleblower thing, potentially, if you are in one of these agencies, you're an, and there is information that you think should get out, but you're not in a position to make sure it gets out. You can confidentially contact us, and if you're able to provide a very specific description of what the information is that we can request, we can be a conduit basically to get stuff out in the light of day that a government employee might not be able to be in a position to do on his own. You know, either legally may not be allowed to do it, but he can tell us confidentially and we can request it and try to get that stuff out into the public. Totally. Yeah. And and the type of information that'd be really helpful was like, would be like a name of a report that you saw right. or a certain memo that some agent saw, or you work in a specific subdivision of a general agency, or you know, a certain certain personnel that are that write really sloppy emails detailing all sorts of juicy stuff that the public should know. I mean, if you tell us the time frames for those things and where we should search, that gives us the best opportunity to get those records and we can get it through legal means and no risk to the whistleblower. So, yeah, we do have an encrypted email that you can contact us. That is a border informant at protonmail.com. Or maybe easier step is just to find that link on the cis.org website at the top right corner of the big red button. So we have a whole bunch of requests, out, right? I don't want to go into detail. Like I said, we're running long here, but we have dozens of FOIA requests that are pending, don't we? Yeah, yeah. We are over 100 FOIA requests and got a bunch of appeals in and we're litigating the ones we have to. The last couple of weeks, we filed two more litigations. And so we're, we're actively getting this information and and forcing agencies to comply with their obligations of FOIA and and 
there's no more important time to get this data, especially when the crisis is just heating up. So just as a final point, we have had published reports and also had a podcast by uh, Todd Benzman and there were a couple, several reports he did about how many people were being either flown in who were inadmissible aliens allowed to fly in by this administration and be released or people who made appointments, essentially scheduled their illegal immigration with the CBP-1 app at the border and were let go. We had to sue to get those numbers. And getting those numbers out was, you know, uh, I think it was important to get those out. And the government would not have released them with the kind of detail that we have if we hadn't sued them. Right. No, sometimes it definitely takes litigation to get these records. There's no two ways around about it. They'll they'll make you wait for years, you know, right. and, and oftentimes this this information is time sensitive, you know, especially with an upcoming election. People are making political choices regarding the border right now, and it's just completely unacceptable for agencies to be trying to delay or, or deny requests based on their political leanings. They have an obligation to produce these records. And if there are some cases where records are, you know, the public's not entitled to them, and that's that's fine. And those are under the FOIA exemptions, and that's just a reality of the deal with. But if they're not, such as the data that Todd Benzman got and other information that we're attempting to obtain, there's no excuses for it, and it's unacceptable. And, and we're definitely showing that we are completely willing to take them to court if they refuse. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you, Colin. Colin Farnsworth, our uh, FOIA whisperer, the director of our FOIA operation, has really ramped up our efforts to get the Biden administration and its various parts to reveal information that they generally don't want people to know. And we're going to keep at it. And hopefully, like I said, if you have any useful information, tips, anything like that, that we can use, there's that button. It's that bright red button on our homepage, cis.org. You can't miss it. I picked the color. Somebody wanted blue, and I said, <laughs> no one will see it if it's blue. So anyway, thank you, Colin, for coming on, walking us through the FOIA process. I know that we're going to be uh, prying some more information, useful and interesting information out. So maybe we'll have you back to talk about that in the future. Just one last thing, you know, as a lawyer, I must give out a quick disclaimer that most things that you see on YouTube or a podcast, this this FOIA is meant to be a primer and should not be taken as legal advice. And you should seek out an attorney for the appropriate information concerning your particular circumstances. But this should give you enough information to get your juices flowing and and hopefully uh, help you navigate the common barriers that people experience when requesting FOIA records. Understood. Thank you very much, Colin. Thank you. And finally, I want to draw your attention to some information we did not have to sue anybody to get or file a Freedom of Information Act request. This is a report on foreign students, and it was just released by the Institute for International Education. It's one of the lobbying groups pushing for looser borders and more immigration, specifically in the context of foreign students. And this report, and we'll have a link in the show notes to our blog post by David North, a fellow here at the center about it. It reports that there's over 1 million foreign students in the country, a 12% increase from the previous report, which is not unexpected, but frankly, still kind of surprising to me. But the interesting wrinkle on this is that the report actually exaggerates the number of foreign students because It does what the federal government does as well, lump in 200,000 people who are on foreign student visas, but are actually just foreign workers. These are people on what is known as the Optional Practical Training Program, OPT, and it's a legal fiction that enables tech companies to hire recent graduates of universities who are foreign students. So this is not people who have green cards and are going to school. These are people who have a visa just to go to an American university. And the terms of that visa are that that it is valid only during the course of study. Well, again, this is the legal fiction part invented by the George W. Bush administration, expanded by Obama, unfortunately not eliminated by the Trump administration when they could have, because it's just a totally made up program that has no basis in law, allows 
foreign students who graduate not to do, say, a three-month internship, but rather for any foreign student, they can work for an entire year on this foreign student visa, essentially masquerading as a student while they're foreign workers. But, and this is the key for the lobbying groups, the tech companies that have pushed this, people who graduate in a STEM field, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, can work for three years. Again, masquerading as students, but actually working as foreign workers. And kind of the cherry on top of this legal fiction is that the employers of these people who pretend to be foreign students still don't have to pay payroll taxes, Social Security, Medicare, and unemployment taxes. And so David North, who did the post that we'll link to on this, estimated that the subsidy from federal taxpayers is something like $1 billion a year. In other words, that employers are subsidized to the tune of $1 billion a year to hire foreigners over Americans. And again, this isn't just even a preference over American citizens. This is a preference over American citizens or legal residents in favor of people who are what in the law are referred to as non-immigrants. In other words, they're supposed to be here temporarily to study in a university, but 200,000 of them, according to this report last year, are just foreign workers. And so this amounts to something like almost 20% of the total supposed foreign student population are in fact just a guest worker program, foreign worker program. So we have details about this, a link to the actual report as well, but it really does shed light on a part of the immigration landscape that doesn't get that much attention. It's gotten somewhat more attention recently because so many foreign students were involved in these pro-Hamas demonstrations. And uh, we've published some on whether they can be deported. In fact, they can. But it's a much larger and wider problem that also relates to the labor force as well as to security threats and anti-American elements among these foreign students. So that's it for this episode of Parsing Immigration Policy. This is Mark Krikorian, your host. Please rate and review us if your podcast platform allows that. And if it's just easier, email us at center at cis.org if you have complaints or compliments or suggestions for future shows. So until the next show, this is Mark Krikorian signing off. <music>